Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Friday Food Fight. My name is Wes Christian, your host for this week, and I am joined once again by Bart Christian, my co-host, and another very special guest. But instead of me doing the introduction, I want to turn it over to Bart and let him introduce our special guest this week, because it's a man that is very close to him. They've been friends for many years, and so, Bart, uh, let's, uh, let's have you bring in our guest today. Hey, Wes, it's it's great to be here. Thank you so much. And it's my great pleasure to bring in Mark Bordeaux. And many of you may not know who don't know Mark Bordeaux. He's the Senior Director of Food Services for the Room Tioga Bosis, where he oversees child nutrition operations for 15 school districts. 15. Uh, He's also the current president of the New York uh, School Nutrition Association. You know, one of the things that a lot of people don't know about Mark is that Mark has been a tireless worker in uh, food banks across the uh, uh, across New York, and uh, you know he's done a lot. I, I kind of share that with you, Mark, and that we've I've, I, I work in my food bank here in Southern Arizona. But you know, before we get into that, I think it's important to know that that about Mark that he has just got a trophy case full of honors. You know, he's been the National Director of the Year for SNA in 2017. He's won the uh, won an award from the Food Bank of the Southern Tier in 2017, the, the Full Circle Award. And I'm going to get you to tell me a little bit more about that in a second, Mark. Uh, you've won multiple awards with NY uh, with the New York School Nutrition Association, and uh, you also were a recipient of the Fame Award. And uh, I, I think that's that's a that, I, you know, Mark. Like I said, I, I imagine you had to build a wing on the house to put all <laughs> to, to put all the honors that that that, that you've gotten. Because I, you know, I, I think it's just impressive. And the thing I want to touch on first is that, you know, I, I go a lot of things. Something people don't know about me is that I go every Saturday and work at the food bank for a good bit of the day. And I've seen, you know, a, a microcosm of, uh, of, of what this whole situation has done to our food banks. But you have, have obviously worked on a much larger level than I do in food banks across New York. So tell us a little about what you're seeing and, and, and tell us a little bit about, you know, what, what you've done in this uh and tell us about the Full Circle Award. Sure. Uh, first, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be uh, on the show. Uh, you guys are both uh, tremendous people and uh, doing great work. And I'm glad to be here today. So the Food Bank Southern Tier has been a passion of mine for, God, 15, 20 years now. Mm-hmm. Uh, my mentor, Ray Denniston, actually uh, got me involved with the Food Bank Southern Tier Great organization, uh, works with seven counties uh, throughout the southern tier of New York State. And uh, they just do, they're innovative. Uh, they're actually the food bank of the year for the, at the national level in 2017 for all wow. the great work they're doing. Uh, but the Full Circle Award was, I mean, probably one of my most honored awards. Again, it's just because I, I believe so much in what the food bank does. But the Full Circle Award was, uh, you know, overall with my work, not only with the food bank as far as being a board member, but being a voice in the community. I would go out uh, to community partners throughout the community and talk about the food bank, advocate for its work. Um, I would also uh, obviously uh, donate quite a bit of money to the food bank because I believe in the organization so much. But as you talked about, uh, Bart, is just being there and and seeing the folks as you, you talk to them and, and hear about the, the needs that they have as you hand out the food. Uh, and the COVID-19 has just seen such a, a demand in the food bank that over the last two months, we've changed our model to where we're doing community food drives. And we're just, as you see on the TV, where you've seen a uh, mile long uh, you know, of cars, we've had the same thing. And to see the folks that come and they're so passionate about the food bank of what they do and the food they're giving these folks right now and the appreciation of the people who are getting the food. Uh, so many of the folks that we talk to that are coming uh, to these food drives now are first time people who have ever come to the food bank yep. uh, and ask for food. So it, it shows of uh, the impact of what COVID-19 has had and, and how more important than ever the work of the food bank and food pantries are uh, for the survival of our country right now. You know, I, I was in a, I was involved in a uh, webinar that you were on with several other directors a couple of weeks ago for our SNA patrons, and you made a comment about the food banks and how you've actually partnered the food banks and the schools in providing food to people. Obviously, helping with the budget of the school district, and also at the same time helping to serve a greater number of people. Tell us a little bit about how that's worked. Sure. Um- we're able to, we, we're feeding between seven and 8,000 
kids and families each day where when the food bank does one of the community drives, they're only hitting about 500, 600 families. And it's in one central location where we're, 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 we're doing is we're within the whole county. We have 60 different sites where we're feeding kids. So we have a broader reach. And so the food bank has taken advantage of that. And we've been able to take advantage of two things. One is the USDA uh, farm to family food boxes, uh, which we're getting in every single week. We get about two to 3,000 boxes every week. And New York State has also had a program uh, for food banks to take advantage of farm fresh products. So our food bank got about a million dollars from New York State to buy farm products fresh to bring in to give out. And we've been able to take advantage of that. Along with um, our dairy association, American, Dor American Dairy Association Northeast has been bringing us tractor trailers of milk to give out to our families in need as well. And again, you know, we can we can reach seven or eight thousand families in one day with a food bank. You know, when they do these drives, they're only hitting 500 people or 500 families. So we have a bigger reach and we're able to have a stronger impact because of where we're at. Well, you, you talk to a lot of directors around the country. Are you are you seeing that? I know that you and I both know that there are a ton of child nutrition directors that that give a lot of time to local food banks, a whole lot. Absolutely. And uh, but are you seeing that that partnership growing more? I mean, I know you talk to a lot of people. Are you seeing that across the country, that partnership between food banks and schools growing? Yes, I've seen a lot of districts doing this, uh, especially with the USDA boxes. Uh, many mm -hmm. districts are able to take advantage of those boxes. Um, again, I, I think we are here for the same same reason. We, yep. we love what we do. We feel so important about what we do and, and want to make such a difference for our families that if the districts can do it, I'm, I'm talking to so many districts that are doing it and trying to do it as much as they can. So I'm not unique to that. Um, and I think especially now we have to do it. I think we are such an important part of the community mm -hmm. that I'm seeing so many folks step up and, and take that role very seriously. All right. Well, Wes, that's the end of my intro. So uh, <laughs> well, I, I, I'm, I'm sitting here quietly. I'm learning so much. I, I, I'm not involved with Food Bank. I feel like now I need to be. Um, but uh, I, I learned so many different things right there. I had no idea of the impact that you all have on a regular basis with these families. It's amazing. Thank you. That's great. Um, now, uh, Bart mentioned in your introduction that you oversee multiple different school districts. 15, I believe, was the number that he said. Yeah. Um, uh, obviously, managing multiple dif uh, districts, lots of staff can be challenging at times, I'm sure. Um, talk to us a little bit about how you communicate with your staff. What, how do you, I mean, obviously, we've got a lot of things going on right now with COVID-19. We've got a lot mm -hmm. of um, uh, civil rights topics that are being talked about. How do you communicate with your staff and get trainings and procedures and things out to these multiple different districts? So, and you talked about challenges. It's It can be challenging, but yet so rewarding uh, at the same time. It's both. Um, we've had to reinvent ourselves as far as communication. Uh, obviously, uh, Zoom has been our, our, our biggest communication piece to get out to our, to our teams. Uh, and Zoom has been a blessing at the same time because we, our districts are so, you know, such a big geographic area from east to west, uh, we're about 75 miles. And then from north to south, about 50 miles. So we have a huge area that we cover. And our training, as far as for our leadership team, we would do some, one central training a couple of times, uh, probably five times a, a year. And it was difficult again, because, you know, they're coming from so many remote areas. Well, Zoom has allowed us to do that more efficiently, you know, where, where people can stay in their office instead of traveling for an hour to us and we can have those conversations. And so we've taken advantage of Zoom uh, tremendously. Uh, we've been able to do a couple trainings in Zoom. Uh, one we just did a couple weeks ago was uh, an emotional wellness training that we brought in a, uh, an emotional wellness expert uh, to talk about it's okay to, you know, feel uh, have grief, be, feel grieving and, and not understand what's going on and try to understand what you're feeling because uh, you need to understand your feelings and deal with them first before you can help your the rest of your team. So that was powerful that we could do that and it's working. So our training mechanism has been Zoom and I think it's a mechanism that we'll continue to use. Um, listen, we want to do face-to-face. -face. That's still our number one preference, mm -hmm. but Zoom can be um, something new in our toolbox that we can take advantage of uh, once we go back to normal, you know, it could be a supplement in between things. 
I've, I've talked to many directors um, that had also been utilizing Zoom or, or a go-to meeting style uh, type, right. uh, uh, you know, meeting organizer. And, um, you know, with any type of new technology, it, pos it poses some challenges, um, especially for Absolutely. some of the um, uh, employees and staff that are less tech technical than, than others. Um, have yeah. you run into any issues with people just not being able to fit? I mean, Zoom's a pretty simple platform, um, but have you run into any issues with people not being able to successfully join meetings and how have you oh, overcome yeah. those? Oh, um, yes. It was it was a challenge at first. It was just patience. Again, just uh, if it wasn't Zoom, we would reach out to them and say, hey, here's the phone number. Just call in. You know, we would try to, you know, uh, what we did at first is we, ha we had practice Zoom meetings for all of our kitchen team members uh of our site people and so we did practice zoom meetings individually so they would feel comfortable with it first before we had our actual first live meeting and i think that, that calmed the nerves of of many of our team because a lot of them as you said weren't tech savvy yeah. uh, so i think by giving them a one-on-one -on -one attention first really helped them once we had our first team meeting together and yeah. after that we had had very few challenges uh, once we did our first initial training now you're in the the Northeast area, which has been one of the hardest hit areas uh, for the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, what's a lesson that you've learned through this process of staying at home and and dealing with these new new directives? A couple things we've learned. One is is I got to give a shout out to my team first and foremost. Um, you know, I, I knew they're an amazing group of people, but it just it re reiterates how amazing they are and how passionate they are for what they do. They'll, they'll work day and night. Some of my team members worked 14 days in a row to just to get started to, to make sure that our team, uh, frontline workers felt comfortable, that we we're doing the best we could for our customers. Um, and I think we learned, again, I think we knew this, but the community learned how important we were to our kids and to our community. Uh, we really were becoming team leaders uh, for the community. Uh, the community looked up to us. They they reached out to us for guidance and support uh, in any way we could. So uh, that's something I learned is that uh, we are true leaders of the community and we need to take that role seriously. And we need to, you know, dive in and really not just now, but in the future, once this is over, continue that leadership role um, for the better of our kids and for our community. You know, it's never, you and I have never doubted. We've always known for tw both of us, 20 plus years, that child nutrition staffs are heroes at what they do every day. Absolutely. And and that, you know, I've stood in front of groups and said, I've never seen so many do so much with so little so fast. And, uh, and, and that's it. And now the whole world knows that. And I think that's yeah. one of the great opportunities we have in child nutrition is to keep blowing that trumpet that we've been somewhat reluctant to blow in the past. Yes, it, it doesn't stop when COVID-19 stops. We got to keep no. on going because there is so much that we can do and so much we should be doing. And uh, you're right, there's heroes. I mean, you hear time and time that so many districts had to put this together in less than 48 hours and yeah. they did it and they did it successfully. So absolutely there. I am proud to be part of this, this um, community uh, of, of leaders that we have right now and part of uh, this profession. It's, it really is a great profession. Yeah, I, I know that you've seen a bunch of those tools that we put together with School Food Handler and sent those things out for the, the COVID. And, you know, I got to say that I've, got, well, I, I've gotten a lot of, you know, compliments for that. But I, but I have to say this. It wasn't me all by myself. I, I picked up the phone on a Saturday and called about a half a dozen directors that I yeah. know personally and said, what do you need? And, and we spent a few hours on the phone talking about procedures and things and, and we quantified it, but it was not just us. It was it, like you said, it was a, it was a team effort across child nutrition and nobody was reluctant to talk. It was great. Yeah. And, and your tools, and I have notes on my desk, uh, especially specifically the standard operating procedures that you developed early on. Uh, those are going to be so instrumental in us opening up schools. So uh, that was one of the first tools you gave out, which was fantastic. And we appreciate that. Well, I appreciate all the help I got from all the folks. That's what I want to say. It was just, it was great. So thank yeah. you very much. Yes. Now, on top of the COVID-19 pandemic, and we can talk about that and, and have talked about on, that on previous shows, um, there's a lot of other things going on in the world right now. And specifically, um, you know, the, the news coverage recently has been on a lot of the civil unrest. 
What's your team's response been to uh, that particular item and the protests that are happening across the country? I mean, obviously we are, we're, we're saddened, um, you know, that it happened. And, uh, but with anything, we have to look at opportunities and ways to improve. And, and that's what we're doing. Um, we're doing a self check, you know, how have we done so far and what can we do to do a better job in the future? And during our self check, and even me personally, um, on the front line and for our folks who are working daily um, at the schools, I think we've done a good job. Can we do a better job? Absolutely. But uh, I think we've done a good job in the front lines. But doing a self check, we can do a much better job with our leadership that we have. Mm -hmm. um, and that's going to be my focus over the next year or two is how can I do a better job of, of diversity in our leadership? And uh, I, I'm right now currently in a, a leadership class in Cornell University called Lead New York. And in year two, I'm, this is perfect timing, but I have to do a, a community project. And in New York State, we have what we call civil service, where all of my leadership team, they have to take a test and finish top three in that test to be hired or considered for hire. And I think we need to do a better job of getting more diverse candidates on the silver service list so they are hireable. So that's gonna be my focus for my research project and my project for my lead in your class is how do we do that? How do we get a, a, a more diverse group of people to sign up for silver service test, be able to pass it and get in the top three so we can hire a more diverse folks? Because those silver service lists are good for five years. So if you're on the list, you're on there for five years until that list is exhausted. So I might have the list from still 2017 that are still valid that we need to improve upon and how do we do that? So um, we definitely need to do a better job with our leadership uh, as far as being diverse. And I know that and I, I'm, I'm up to the challenge to do that. Now, what do you think uh, that our responsibility is in both child nutrition and outside of child nutrition in our personal lives uh, to uh, really promote inclusion and meaningful conversations with our peers or coworkers or family um, around unconscious bias that, that exists? Well, I think you, you, you talk about conversation. It, it's got to be a conversation. We can't have our heads in the sand anymore. We have to, we have to talk about it, be open about our mistakes that what we've done, uh, because you don't learn if you're not willing to admit your mistakes. You have to admit you made mistakes and how do you grow from that and how do we go forward and improve on, to do a better job? Uh, right now, I think, uh, you know, is, is no better time. Uh, SNA has a great com incoming leader in Reggie Ross, uh, which I believe Reggie was on your show a couple weeks ago. Mm. Uh, Reggie is, uh, such a tremendous leader. I've, I've admired Reggie. I was on the board of Reggie a couple of years ago for SNA. And, and Reggie is so passionate about child nutrition and so passionate about what he does. And I think right now, Reggie can really lead a conversation nationally for all of us to say, we need to do better. Uh, and we have to do that. First, we have to admit that we need to do better and then figure out how can we do better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think you're right. It starts with listening. And it starts with listening to understand and empathetic yes. listening because, you know, one of the things I think that so many times we do is, you know, I, I have a good friend that I was made, I made a comment to that I said, we're kind of in this state of, you know, I'm right and you're wrong and just shut up. And, yeah. uh, and, and, and that's just not going to work. And, and, and we have to be willing to not only hear, not only listen, but hear and then hear to understand. And that's the next step that I think so many people struggle with is that, willingness to sit and listen to something that's absolutely conflict, you know, at, at, at direct confront confrontation with what they believe, but yet right. try to understand why the other person actually believes that versus trying to put their views forth. And I think that's kind of the, where we are. Yep. It's not, it's not going to be easy, uh, no. but, but growing in true leadership is never easy, but we have to be willing to do it. And we have to be willing to power through all the controversy and all the white background noise that you're hearing in the background, um, all the negativity and mm -hmm. saying, we can do this, we can do better, and we have to do better. You know, Bart, you mentioned the word empathy. And, I, it, you know, I think that it's fair to say that we all 
want a working environment that feels safe and where we can also freely express our goals and beliefs. Uh, Mark, what do you or how do you think uh, we can accomplish this with our staff while still being empathetic to everyone? I think, it, again, we've talked about this a couple of times is you have to be there. You have to, you know, be willing to listen, uh, be vulnerable. I think you have to be vulnerable for your staff and um, just, I think, listen, you listen to them. You have to be honest with them. And, you know, the things you can you can solve quickly and be able to solve quickly, you do that. And the things that are going to take time, you develop a plan and let them know, hey, I, I hear you. Uh, we're going to do the best we can to develop something that will make your job easier um, and to make it safer. Uh, but I think it's just being empath empathetic, as we talked about a couple of times, being empathetic, listening, be available, and be willing to say, I don't have all the answers right now, but I'll, I'm going to do the best I can to get the answers that will be right by you. Uh, now, uh, to kind of change gears, you obviously manage a lot of districts, as we've mentioned in the past, uh, mm -hmm. in the first part of the show. Um, with those districts, a lot of directors, and I'm sure yourself and your team are doing this as well, are looking at bringing new people on for this upcoming school year. And I would imagine with 15 different districts, you're most likely going to be bringing a lot of people on. Yes. Um, how are you hand planning on approaching and handling staffing uh, for hiring in this upcoming school year for the present role, but while planning for the, I guess, kind of unknown of what the fall might bring? That's a great question, especially we don't know what the fall. Here in New York State, we don't even know if we're opening up in the fall yet or not. Um, you know, there's a lot of conversations going on, but nothing definite if we are opening or not. Um, I think it's an opportunity for us to uh, recruit. You know, I think it's an opportunity for us to grow as an organization. And we've always in the past, I think, waited for people to come to us. You know, we've just waited for the application. We'd call personal office, say, you have any applications for us? Um, yes or no. And, and if we didn't get them, okay. I think we need to do a better job of going out and looking for staff members. You know, if you're in a restaurant and you see somebody giving you good customer service, try to recruit them saying, hey, have you ever thought about school food service? And have this conversation about what school food service is and how, a great, how, how it could be a great career. Uh, that's something I think we could do a better job at. And I think that's probably going to be something I can do, you know, even in COVID-19, if, if I'm going out, you know, in, in a small setting or something, if I see somebody that I see as potential that can work in our environment and be a success, uh, I'm going to do a better job of, of recruiting uh, when I'm out, uh, even even going grocery shopping. If I see somebody that's potential is just tutor on horn and being visible and trying to recruit instead of for instead of waiting people to come to us, I'm going to go and try to find some great people to work for us. You know, one of the best people I ever hired in the last 25 years was somebody I hired back in Georgia and she was driving a beverage cart on the golf course. And she was just so pleasant and so nice. And one of the just generally, you know, just a generally nice person. And, uh, and I, I pursued her actually called her a couple of times, got her to come for an interview. She's now, the Southeastern regional manager for uh, SFS pack, you know, and uh, she, that she got her start with us. And it was just very, it's just, you know, you, you never know. Yeah. Uh, you got to kind of go with that gut. But I got one kind of follow-up question on what you said is, is this, that as we, as we see unemployment benefits, these extended benefits or enhanced benefits begin to dwindle out. And at the end of June, you know, and we're going to see more people coming back into the workforce, I believe as things open up, do you see that as an opportunity for uh, child nutrition? Because there's going to be some restaurant people that have that experience level, but their their restaurants are not going to be there anymore. Their jobs are not going to be there anymore because of what's happened, or at least not there immediately because of the reduced serving uh, numbers. Uh, yeah. do, you, do you think that's some way that child nutrition or school nutrition in general should try to recruit those people? And how oh, would you, you do that? Absolutely. I think there's a couple ways you could do it. First, you could do... Um, you know, you can go to you can go to the unemployment office and and and, and let them know that you're hiring. Uh, you could promote job fairs, even if it's online. You could do an online job fair. Mm -hmm. Say, hey, you know, we're doing open recruiting. We'd love to meet you. Um, you know, here's a link. Uh, you know, sign on. You know, give them all time to sign on. 
there's different things you can do, I believe, to to do that, um, especially since you can't have in-person job fairs, or if you can, do an, an in-person job fair. Uh, but again, I, I, I don't think we should, at the, the time of, of the, waiting for the applications to come to you is over, you need to get out there and, and find folks to hire. Um, you know, I think going to the unemployment office or recruitment office in your local city or, or county and let them know that you're hiring um, and giving your contact information is a good start, though, probably. Sure. Now, has, have, have you uh, put a plan together or have something in mind for recruiting specifically um, to really support diversity and, and, you know, these new folks that you're going to go and be seeking out? Yep. We actually had um, yesterday was our first um, our diversity. We had a diversity training yesterday for an hour and a half uh, to talk about that a little bit as far as um, going out and recruiting and, and, and talk about ways to go out and recruit folks. Um, our personnel director at BOCES was there and actually did some of the training. And he's done an excellent job of helping us uh, guide us through recruiting. Uh, and some of the tips I've, I've talked about is what he recommended is just going out, being visible. Uh, to the community and, and talking about what a great place schools are and school food services to work. Mm -hmm. uh, but you have to go out there and you have to tote uh, what you do. Um, it's just, it's changed. You have to, you just have to be that voice. Now, have you, you mentioned some diversity training. Um, have you found good civil rights diversity training to really address the current climate um, that, that you would recommend to folks? So I've, I've heard from several directors that they're having a hard time finding resources to use. I, I agree. It is, it is a challenge. I, I know it in uh, in January uh, in California, SNA had a, um, a great diverse diversity speaker, but he still didn't talk about even to the next level what's going on right now. Um, I think it's a challenge to find uh, great speakers. I'm sure they're out there and they're probably really, really busy, um, but yeah, I've not been able to find a great one either that really can dive in and ask those tough questions and, and push you to the next level. Um, now, as far as training is concerned, uh, with the startup of school, and, and you mentioned earlier that you're not even really sure if you're gonna have a startup of school at, when it's you know supposed to happen, but yep. we've obviously gotta continue to plan as though we will open up on time. Right. How, have your, how have your plans changed in terms of bringing staff back, training to start this upcoming year off with COVID-19 and, and all the civil rights uh, challenges? So a couple things we're doing is, is one is uh, we can have small, we, you know, we're in, in our area, we're in phase four of opening up for New York State. So we can have small gatherings. So we have a, uh, usually have a large serve safe training uh, every summer. Uh, we'll do more frequent ones uh, with less people. So we'll offer more serve safe trainings. Uh, we are starting to develop a, for our leadership team, Zoom meetings um, right now. So we will have a couple of days of Zoom meetings uh, in August uh, with our team leadership. And, you know, we'll develop those. And then we're also developing uh, with your program uh, is an ICN. Uh, you know, we are developing trainings for our staff when they come back that they can do at home um, or at the school. Um, but your program, Food Handler, is fantastic. And we're really, more than ever, uh, is gonna be a major part of our training program for the fall. Um, it's gonna be tremendous. That's If we didn't have your program, uh, it would be a, a, a bigger challenge for us. So we're, we're lucky that we're part of your, your family and uh, we're definitely gonna use your program a lot for our frontline staff. Oh, wonderful. I'm very happy to hear you say that, yeah. yeah. Um, now, you know, mentioning, uh, you know, going back this upcoming year and, and kind of getting your office staff back together, what's one kind of office tradition that you're most looking forward to getting back to? <laughs> Probably simple, but just being able to walk in and have everybody there, you know, just walk in and having the people you, you know, that, you know, for the last 10 years, you spent more time with them mm -hmm. than you have with your own family. You know, uh, I miss that. I, I miss seeing, you know, uh, Rosa, who's in my office every day, um, who's been with me for 16 years, uh, talking to her and, and seeing how her family is doing and, and talking with everybody else. It's probably simple, you know, probably the simplest, but probably one of the joyous things I have is just seeing them on a daily basis and communicating with them. Simple, but that's probably my biggest thing I'm looking forward to. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I know I, I know Bart's been going out to a lot of restaurants here uh, recently and, uh, you know, with things kind of, you know, opening back up and, and you guys and, and stage four, you said of kind of reopening, um, you know, what what's a, a restaurant that you're really excited to, to go back to or if you have gone out recently, uh, what'd you order? <laughs> Uh, we have we've been still doing a lot of takeouts. Uh, okay. One restaurant that just opened up last week, uh, we opened back up, is one of our favorites, and it's called the Taco Garage. All right. Uh, wow. It's just a small little restaurant, and literally it has um, a garage door that opens up and has a beautiful patio. Uh, but I, we love to go there. It's a great atmosphere, uh, right in downtown Binghamton, and the food is fantastic. Uh, my favorite there is. Uh, Steak tacos. It's actually made with filet mignon tips. Uh, it's just oh. fantastic. And you side that with their, their homemade margaritas. Uh, they actually make a homemade mix for the margaritas. It's just, yeah, can't wait to get back there. Oh, you're making me hungry right now, Mark. <laughs> for real. Uh, well, Mark, in kind of closing today, is there anything that you would uh, like to kind of close our viewers out with or any maybe piece of advice for new directors or staff coming into um, you know, the, the upcoming school year. Sure. If, if you're a new director, uh, you're, you're coming in at trying times, of course, but there's no better uh, career than being in child nutrition. Uh, you will meet some amazing people. Uh, there's great leaders out there and they're all willing to help and support you. Uh, we have a great family here. Uh, you know, we feed off each other. There's, uh, you yeah. know, I, I have no problem calling directors throughout the country and, and asking for advice and they give me honest advice which i appreciate um and just stay strong and you know anybody even if you're you're a new director or a seasoned director is be strong and know that you, you might not have all the answers uh which might be new territory for you but that's okay uh you know accept that uh do the best you can and uh be honest with yourself and be honest with your staff and Together, we'll get through this. Uh, I, I see our strongest days are still ahead, uh, even though we're in tough times now. But uh, be strong and, and know that you're not alone in this. And uh, we're here as a family, and we'll get through this as a family together. That's very well said. I truly think we're poised to be elevated in the community and in the country in child nutrition to a level like we've never seen before if we will just simply grasp hold of it and, and keep and keep at it because it, it is it is a it's going to be a trying time but it is a time of great opportunity if we just don't if we don't miss it yep um you're you're exactly right uh, where they say that the uh uh it's always darkest before the dawn and mm -hmm. I, I see a beautiful dawn ahead of us uh that uh, is going to be fantastic and we're gonna our industry is going to be st stronger than ever in a couple of years i, I believe that Mm -hmm. Me Absolutely. too. Absolutely. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for being on the show. Mark, it's been a, a, just a pleasure to have you on and to yeah, talk with you for a little bit. And uh, Bart, always good to see you as well. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we will definitely have to have you back on very, very soon. Absolutely. So, Thanks, everybody. Um, have, have a great day and have a great upcoming July 4th. Absolutely. God bless, Mark. Thanks so much. Thank you. God bless everybody. Take care. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been another episode of Friday Food Fight. My name is Wes Christian, and we look forward to seeing you again next Friday at 12 o'clock Pacific Standard Time. Take care, everyone.